This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidou It's Wednesday, June 12th. This is Africa 54. Despite a peace deal, many South Sudanese living in Ugandan refugee camps are still afraid to return home. How doctors in the Democratic Republic of Congo are combating sleeping sickness. And we'll tell you how Cameroon farmers are using the internet to find customers and boost their income. We begin our broadcast in East Africa, where Uganda hosts Africa's largest refugee population, 1.25 million people, with slightly more than 66% having fled conflict in South Sudan. Last year's peace deal raised hopes for some South Sudanese that they could soon return home. But the fragile peace has discouraged many from leaving Uganda's refugee camps, despite struggles for adequate aid. Halima Thumani reports from Ajumani, Uganda. James Gwemawer joins other South Sudanese elders for a board game at the Maji refugee settlement in Uganda. It's been six years since he arrived here after losing his cattle during fighting in South Sudan. His family is scattered to different refugee settlements in Uganda and he's still wondering when they can all go home. I need to first witness peaceful resettlement of my people back home, with no war or tribal conflict before I can return. But now, I can't think of going back. Things are still bad. I can't leave. 63-year-old Madalena Moriah hopes to return to South Sudan one way or another. My husband died and was buried in South Sudan. My other children are buried there. When I die, I want to be buried beside them. There are over 800,000 South Sudanese refugees in settlements just inside Uganda, more than four times the number in 2016. Uganda's State Minister for Refugees says their ability to help is being challenged. We have never known that at any given time will host over one million people. We had always oscillated between 200, 1,000, 300. That was what we knew, even at the peak of displacement from DR Congo, from Rwanda, and from Burundi. But when South Sudan collapsed, then we received refugees surpassing a million, and that overwhelmed our systems. In May, Uganda and the United Nations Refugee Agency appealed for 927 million U.S. dollars in funding to address refugee needs until 2020. The appeal is complicated by the alleged misuse of aid and exaggeration of refugee numbers that saw four Ugandan officials dismissed and investigations launched. The United Nations Refugee Agency says donors also no longer see the situation as an emergency. We're falling short of what is really required in terms of access to basic services, such as education, water is slightly better covered, health slightly better covered, but education, needs for environment, energy, protection, where we're falling short of really what the refugees deserve and need. For the time being, South Sudanese refugees in Uganda will get by on basic services and wait for the day when it is safe to return home. Halima Osmani for VA News, Ajumani, Uganda. Staying in Uganda where a child has died of Ebola in the first cross-border case of the virus since an outbreak began in neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo a year ago. The Ugandan Office of the World Health Organization, according to the health minister, reported the death of the five-year-old boy Wednesday. The WHO first reported the case on Monday. At Monday's news conference, Health Minister Dr. Jane Ruth Asheng said the child had been taken to Kaganda Hospital in western Uganda after he and several family members crossed over from the DRC. Acheng says Ugandan officials are working with international agencies to prevent the spread of the deadly disease. The Ministry of Health, the World Organization and the Center for Disease Control have dispatched a rapid response team to Kasese 
to support the teams who are on the ground to continue with the various activities, including contact tracing and case management. The Ministry of Health, WHO and CDC will undertake ring vaccination of contacts to the case and other non-vaccinated frontline health workers, as well as other workers beginning 14th June 2019. Asheng says Uganda in total has confirmed three cases of Ebola. She urged Ugandans to cooperate with health officials to prevent the often deadly virus from spreading to other parts of the country. The WHO and its partners have struggled to contain the outbreak in eastern Congo, sometimes facing resistance from locals who do not trust health workers. The health agency says the virus has killed nearly 1,400 people in the region since last August. Doctors in the Democratic Republic of Congo are working to reduce the number of people suffering from sleeping sickness, the insect-borne parasitic disease that afflicts humans and animals. Anastasia Tudieshe has more from Kinshasa. In the Kimwenza neighborhood of the capital, mobile care units train more than 300 people a day for sleeping sickness. Team leader Dr. Danilo Makiala says its effects are devastating. It is a disease with serious complications, particularly neurological. Patients sometimes demonstrate behavioral disorders that people describe as madness, such as being twitchy. Sleeping sickness is spread by the painless bite of the tsetse fly. Congo's National Sleeping Sickness Control Manager, Dr. Eric Mwamba, says that makes fishermen especially vulnerable. All these people who make the the tsetse fly loves to go where there is shade and water. Additionally, the population of Kinshasa buys food from the province of Bandundu. Returning from there, they bring the disease with them. In a country with 80% of the world known cases, those infected can be slow to act because some of the symptoms of sleeping sickness so closely mirror other tropical diseases. I brought my son to the screening, and I thought that it was malaria, but I was told it was sleeping sickness. This mother in Kimwenza says she first had the disease 20 years ago, but has since remained healthy with proper treatment. Her neighbor says he has seen the impact of the disease, but is still happy to be diagnosed and sickness-free. In any case, I'm very happy to know that it is sleeping sickness. I've seen the effect. It has broken the lives of so many people I know. Dr. Mwamba says better screening and better treatment mean fewer Congolese are suffering from sleeping sickness. In 2013, we had 5,000 cases. Two years ago, it was 1,100. Today, it is less than 650. That is thanks to the Ministry of Health commitment which brought partners' involvement, which helped the research move forward significantly. The goal is to reach less than one new case per 10,000 inhabitants. And by 2030, we think we can do it, but only if everyone gets involved. With sleeping sickness in 22 of Congo's 26 provinces, Dr. Mwamba says public screenings like this are the best prevention. Anastasi Tudiesh for VOA News, Kinshasa. Sudan's military leaders and opposition groups have agreed to resume talks on the formation of a transitional council. According to Ethiopian envoy Mahmoud Diril, an opposition alliance will suspend its campaign of civil disobedience and strikes. Sudan's transitional military council also agreed to release political prisoners as a confidence-building measure. These steps appeared to show a softening of positions after talks between the two sides collapsed following the violent breakup of a protest sitting on June 3rd. Dozens of people were killed in the crackdown, dealing a major setback to the hopes of a transition towards democratic elections after the ouster of former leader Omar al-Bashir in April. The Declaration of Freedom and Change Forces Alliance on Sunday began an open-ended strike that brought much activity in Khartoum to a standstill. The Transitional Military Council has agreed on building trusts between parties. In doing so, the Council has agreed to release all political prisoners from the side of the Declaration of Freedom and Change Forces that has shown its willingness and has agreed to suspend the civil disobedience on this day, June 11th, in Khartoum. 
The alliance said in a statement it would suspend the strike beginning Wednesday until further notice, although it encouraged people to remain mobilized for possible further action. In 2009, Jesse Martin, then Al-Qaeda's chief American propagandist, launched a glossy online publication called Jihad Recollections, which years later gave rise to the Islamic State's Dabiq and Rumiya magazines. But that same propagandist is now a changed man. Using the same tactics that he learned from the old publication, he's launched a new magazine, this time with the aim of countering online jihadi propaganda. Masood Farivar reports and BOS Mil Asega narrates. Two glossy magazines that are mirror images of the other, but one glorifies the caliphate, the other shows its violence. We're using uh, a template uh, and a, a, a medium uh, that has been incredibly successful in the jihadosphere and by taking them back, you can end the legacy. That's Jesse Morton. Morton was once Al-Qaeda's chief American propagandist and creator of Jihad Recollections, the first jihadi propaganda magazine. But having renounced violence, Morton now promotes a counter-narrative through his new magazine called Ahul Taqwa. And so what we've done is we've, rather than show pictures of people killing as if it's a good thing, we'll have pictures of people dead in the street where there's a baby doll sitting beside the body bag. The 39-page publication rivals jihadi magazines in production quality, but offers a very different vision of Islamic State. In a letter from the editor, Morton writes, Ahul Taqwa seeks not to kill these individuals, but to kill their false ideas and ideals. Morton's partner in the venture is Mitch Silver, a former intelligence director for the New York Police Department. Clearly, the message, the idea of ISIS, ISIS the movement is still out there, even if ISIS the organization, ISIS the physical caliphate has taken a beating. Today, Morton and Silver run Parallel Networks, a group that works to de-radicalize former jihadis and other extremists. Ahul Taqwa is their brainchild. So we thought in order to challenge that message, um, not only did the message need to be crafted, but it needed to be sent out in a way, in a medium, that people who are attracted to the ISIS uh, ideology might also take a look at. While the new publication has prompted civil discussion, it's also led to death threats against its creators. For Masood Farivar, Milar Sega, VOA News, Washington. After U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un met last June in Singapore, Trump declared there is no longer a nuclear threat from North Korea. Now exactly one year later, that meeting and nuclear deal still seems more elusive than ever. VOA's William Gallo reports from Seoul. In Singapore last June, U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un agreed to work toward the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Though it was a vague statement, many hoped it could help end decades of animosity between the United States and North Korea. A year later, things appear to be headed in the opposite direction. North Korea has resumed testing short-range ballistic missiles. The United States and North Korea haven't held working-level talks in months, and North Korea hasn't answered U.S. requests to restart the negotiations. But Trump remains optimistic. I just received a beautiful letter from Kim Jong-un. I, I can't show you the letter, obviously, but it was a very personal, very warm, very nice letter. I appreciate it. Trump also says he is open to a third summit with Kim, though there's little evidence that could break the deadlock. The on-the-ground, mid-level exchanges, negotiations, are really going to be doing the work, and we haven't really seen that. Absent those working-level negotiations, any sort of top-down uh, processes seem sort of moot. Trump says he's in no hurry for a deal, but North Korea does appear to be in a rush. Kim has given the United States until the end of the year to change its approach. A possible breakthrough could happen later this month when Trump visits here in South Korea. There's even been speculation about a possible third Trump-Kim summit. But if that does happen, the pressure on Trump will be immense to deliver more results than he did in the previous two summits. Bill Gallo, VOA News, Seoul. And we'll be right back. Stay with us.
I am Sheka Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic. It is the beat. The African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct. And adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. South African artist Enoch Malangeni can't afford art supplies, so he uses coffee instead. The 27-year-old stumbled on this form of art when he spilled coffee on a piece of art and couldn't get rid of the stain. He's gone viral on social media since then for his portraits of famous people, such as Trevor Noah and internationally acclaimed DJ Black Coffee. Social media has helped Milangeni overcome the lack of access to galleries and collectors that come with living in a township like Sesolberg. His portraits and paintings cost between $800 to $1,200. Thanks to backing from investors betting that the meteoric rise of two-wheeled taxi firms in Asia can be replicated in some of the fastest growing countries in the world. Next up, Motorcycle taxi companies are expanding in West Africa thanks to backing from investors betting that the meteoric rise of two-wheeled taxi firms in Asia can be replicated in some of the fastest growing countries in the world. Four bike taxi firms are now battling it out on the streets of Nigeria's commercial capital Lagos and the oldest Nigerian motorcycle taxi firm Max.ng is planning to launch in Ghana and Ivory Coast this year as well as a fourth Nigerian city. The four companies are also looking to turn their ride-hailing apps into one-stop mobile shops, offering a host of services from e-payments to deliveries to insurance. Africa offers huge potential for motorcycle ride-hailing firms due to low personal car ownership, rapidly expanding populations, and a lack of efficient mass transport systems in fast-growing cities that are clogged with cars. And finally, a local animal shelter with animals painted on its sides is hitting the roads of Amman to help people of the Jordanian capital get their pets the care they need. The van is the country's first door-to-door -door pet grooming service, providing animal owners with a convenient way to care for their pets without leaving their homes. The van is fitted with stainless steel counters for haircuts and claw trims, as well as a specialized shower system the price of the services range from $35 to $55, depending on the size of the animal. The owner's new goal is to include veterinary services, and that's what's trending today. U.S. President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden both ventured into the Midwestern state of Iowa Tuesday, each seeking to persuade 2020 voters that he is the person with a vision and strength to lead the nation. Trump and Biden have been trading barbs ever since Biden announced his candidacy in the 2020 U.S. presidential election. VOA's Ladza Hoke recaps their day of sparring. During his Tuesday events in Iowa, Trump clearly had the 2020 presidential election in mind. The Republican president, who is expected to run for re-election, took every opportunity to undermine the record of the Obama administration and scorn former Vice President Biden. America must never again be held hostage to foreign suppliers of energy as we were under the Obama-Biden Sleepy Joe group. Sleepy Joe. 
Trump's top argument in his favor has been the U.S. economic growth, but his tariff policies have hurt U.S. farmers and some manufacturers, sparking concern that the economy could take a downturn. Trump insisted that U.S. farmers benefit from the tariffs. We are taking in billions, and out of those billions that were taken in in tariffs, we gave the farmer $16 billion because that was the highest amount that China had ever used to purchase your product. Earlier in the day, Trump posted a barrage of tweets expressing confidence in his re-election, including a recent approval rating, which was close to 50 percent, according to the Rasmussen report. However, a Quinnipiac University survey published Tuesday showed Biden leading Trump by 13 points nationally. Biden began his two-day visit to Iowa earlier Tuesday, targeting Trump's leadership style. I think he's genuinely a threat to our core values. And he's a threat to our standing in the world on the D-Day ceremonies, the D-Day ceremonies. It was astounding to me that he was tweeting attacks on everybody, from the mayor of London to uh, Bette Midler. The Democratic presidential frontrunner also contradicted Trump's claims on tariffs. The fact is, uh, he backed off this threat on tariffs with Mexico lately because uh, he uh, realized that um, he was likely to lose Michigan, Ohio, and Iowa. All of a sudden, he has, as we say in southern Delaware, had an altar call. He's seen the Lord. And, uh, but make no mistake, uh, if, uh, if in fact uh, things get tough again, he's going to start to threaten tariffs again. Uh, and uh, to him, American workers, in my view, are just a pawn. There are pawns in his game. For now, Biden and Trump are front runners of their respective parties in the next presidential race. But November 2020 is still far away, and the 2016 election showed that last minute surprises cannot be ruled out. Zlatica Hoke, VOA News, Washington. In our technology segment, information technologies are changing the lives of many Cameroonian farmers who previously were dependent on brokers who charged fees to serve as middlemen to buyers. Now they can use the internet to find customers more easily and increase their income. Anne Nzwankeu reports from Douala, Cameroon, and Moki Edwin Kinzeka narrates. Farmer Loic Domgia sells almost all of his produce online and through phone apps. He's been using the internet for the last year and say it's improved his income. Before, we waited to produce before looking for buyers. But through this platform, we can work now, knowing that we have a precise customer who has already placed the order. It reduces the stress on the producer. The producer no longer waits until the end to search for the client. He sleeps well knowing he already has orders on his production. Domgwea uses a local platform that links producers and buyers, allowing producers to sell directly to the customer without brokers who work as intermediaries. The app even makes it possible for the farmers to receive advanced payments. The application is called Jangolo Farmers. The designers say it helps farmers to sell before harvest. There is also a difference regarding the price when you buy a product on Jangolo Farmer. Since the number of intermediaries is considerably reduced, the buyer gains by buying a product at a lower price. The farmer on his side has a higher profit margin by selling through our application. Cameroon National Institute of Statistics reports that 25% of the population is connected daily to the Internet and users are more often buying agri-food products online. I make orders to buy chickens online just because I do not have enough time as I work at the gym from morning till night. I chose to place an order online so that it can be delivered here. Experts say it's a good initiative to develop agri-food online sales platforms, but 
Much remains to be done. If a company does not own stores, it would be difficult for buyers to evaluate the product they're buying. They should have a space where one can evaluate the product before paying. The lack of a store is an obstacle to the development of this type of e-commerce. The African Development Bank estimates there are more than a billion mobile phone subscribers in Africa, making the market bigger than either the European Union or the United States. For Anne Mireille Nzuanke in Douala, Cameroon, Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News. It may be years before self-driving cars take us where we want to go. Meantime, car companies are already incorporating self-driving technologies to make cars safer. One is a sensor called LIDAR, a laser beam that bounces off objects and is used to make 3D maps in real time. Here's VOA's Michelle Quinn with an up-close look at this new technology. This small box attached to the top of this car is doing important work. It's a sensor sending out pulses of invisible light, which allows the car to see on its own. It's called a LiDAR sensor. What a LiDAR does using light technology, eye-safe laser beams emit from our sensor, they hit an object, and are bounced back to the sensor, uh, gathering data about the distance in time. So um, as it's rotating, it essentially is gathering billions of data points as to all of the objects in um, the surrounding area. As the car moves, the LiDAR sensors are almost spray painting the world with light, calculating how long it takes for the light to bounce back. This creates a map that can help a car make decisions. When to slow down, when to hit the gas, when to turn the wheel. So whether it's a soft object like a person or a dog or um, uh, whatever, or a hard object like a truck or another car, LiDAR is equal uh, to the task of giving you the image. Not all companies working on self-driving cars are using LiDAR. The hope is to create robotic drivers that are better than human ones. And for us as humans not to make those human errors that are going to be a lot safer and a lot less crashes, which will result in um, a decrease in death and serious injuries on our roadways. That safer driving future is spurring car companies to invest in technology today. For many, it begins with a spinning LiDAR sensor atop a car, essentially giving the car special eyes. Michelle Quinn, VOA News, San Francisco. Great stuff. And that's our show for today. Watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.